Hi, my name is David Lewis, and I'm a member here at Crossroads Covenant Church. I joined Crossroads about nine years ago, and the reason I joined Crossroads was uh, we celebrated the life going uh, services for my baby sister, Lois Bryant, and I was just fluid, fluid by the amount of attention and love that the congregation had shared with our family. Uh, we have one of the most dynamic preachers and uh, pastor, uh, Joseph Rashid. He has always embraced our family and I consider him like a big brother to me. <clears throat> As uh, we prepare for our Sunday virtual service, we welcome you to Crossroads Covenant Church where you will be able to uh, participate in the service as well as communion uh, and an opportunity to join service or church. Welcome to Crossroads. Well, good morning and welcome to Crossroads Covenant Church. Sister Janet won't be with us today. I asked her if she would allow me to lead worship today. She said yes. Praise and worship has always been a part of our heritage. And praise and worship has always been in the church. When the old deacons led devotion, that was praise and worship. When the old mothers would sing out a hymn, that was praise and worship. Many of those songs we don't sing today. We have new songs. But the old songs are just as valuable and just as real. Today, I'd like to invite you to sing some of those songs with me. I know you know it. I know you do. So join in with me. Let's sing together. Also sang songs that were individualized as part of our worship too. When you think about this present time of the pandemic and all the fear and the hatred and the vitrality that's going on here, you, you say to yourself, how am I doing? And you wonder. You can say it is well. Many of us remember that we used to sit and listen to the old folks sing and they would sing, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Won't you sing that with me? Come on. 
I'm sure you know it, so sing with me goes. I love to praise him. I love to praise his name. I love to praise him. I love to praise his name. I love to praise him. I love to praise his name. I love to praise him. The holy name. I love to Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. I hope you've enjoyed those songs of worship. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it has prepared your hearts for receiving uh, the Lord's Supper. It's always great to gather around the table in fellowship. And at this time, I hope that you've had an opportunity to grab your elements, your bread, your water, as we are now getting ready to enter into this sacred time. So let us go now before the Lord and pray for these elements. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the preparation of our hearts. We thank you, Father, for the broken body and spilled blood, your broken body and spilled blood, that we may be one with you. Now, Lord, as we prepare to intake, to digest what you've done for us, I pray, God, that we will be strengthened and renewed in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night that he was betrayed with his disciples, he took the bread, he lifted it, he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying that this is my body, broken for you. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And then he commanded his disciples to take and eat all of it. Let us now eat together. Likewise, he took the cup. He explained, this is a new covenant, a covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you do, you're proclaiming my death, my burial, my resurrection, and my coming again. Aren't you glad that he is coming again? Amen? Amen. 
Then he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink all of it. Let us now drink together. Let us now recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Crossroads Live. Welcome to the sanctuary of our great God. Crossroads Live is here and ready. You know, uh, last week I had to congratulate our youth, but today I want to congratulate a whole nother group of people. It's our groundskeepers. Week after week, they come down to the church and they keep the church spotless. They give their time, they give their energy into keeping the church the grass is cut, it's edged neatly. Everything looks good when you come onto the property because the men of Crossroads, particularly this grounds crew, they have worked hard. They have given their best to make sure that the church still looks good. Some people have asked me, are you guys having service again? And I say, well, we're doing virtual services. But these men have given their time to make it look like we're here every day, having church every day. So congratulations, men. Thank you so very much for the work that you are doing in Crossroads. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving your time, giving your talent. Uh, most of all, for making the church look good. <clears throat> Just as the men have given their time, have given of their talent, uh, we need you also to give. We need you to give to the ministry of Crossroads, whatever you have. It doesn't matter what you have. Just give to the ministry of the gospel so that we can continue to edify and to magnify his holy name. Uh, today, I'm, I want to continue my series, Being a Servant, Being a Servant. Uh, by servant, I mean a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, willing to manifest Christ's character at all times. That's what I mean when I say servant. I don't mean a member of the church, because you could be a member of a church, but not be a servant of Christ. I don't mean being on, on a particular group or auxiliary in the church because you could be there too and not necessarily be a servant of Christ. By a servant of Christ, I mean a fully devoted follower of Christ, ready, willing to manifest his character at all times, good or bad, just honoring him. As a matter of fact, that's what we began the series with, honoring the Lord. How do we honor the Lord? We talked about the purpose of serving with honor. And we talked about an argument breaking out with the disciples. And we realized that arguments are uh, based on what's going on inside of an individual. When people are arguing with you, nine times out of ten, it has nothing to do with you. But it has everything to do with what's going on inside of them. An argument breaks out, and this argument was one for this desire of prestige and power. What we're going to talk about today is serving with humility. Serving with humility. Navigate your way with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 47 and 48. And while you're getting your passages ready, allow me to pray. Holy God, great creator, we come before you humbly asking that you will speak to our heart and speak to our mind and allow us to receive the truth of your word so that we will be better servants for you, serving you with honor, but most of all, serving you with humility. Be glorified, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. In Luke 
chapter 9, verse 47 and 48, it reads like this. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you who is the greatest of all. This passage is often used to show how much Jesus loves children. And he does. Jesus loves children. And he welcomes them to come to him. But today I want us to discover, to uncover a greater message of how we can be servants of humility using this passage. When I say humility, I mean a modest view of self. A modest view of self. It's freedom from pride and arrogance. It's knowing who you are, but being free of having uh, to, to announce it. There's no pride. There's no arrogance. You just are who you are, and you're just grateful for who you are. It's humility, true humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking of yourself less. You're not less than anyone. But it's thinking of yourself less. Humility of character. And character is the individual distinct moral qualities that you, pers pr that you possess. Let's look at our first point. The humility of character. By character, I mean the individual distinct moral qualities that you alone possess. In Philippians chapter 2, Jesus Christ, uh, the Bible says, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. That's humility. Jesus Christ set the example of character in his humility. He was equal to God. He had the same power of God. He was God Almighty. He was born that way, but he did not assume uh, that authority as an equality to God, but rather he humbled himself and was obedient to God. He didn't use it for his own advantage. Remember, he said, take this cup from me, but if it's your will. Humility. Humility never relinquishes authority. If you're a parent, you never relinquish your authority of being a parent. You're still the parent. If you're a police officer, you never relinquish your authority. You're still a police officer. If you're a doctor, you're still in authority over your staff. If you're a church leader, being humble does not mean that you listen and you follow everyone. No, it means that you are a leader, but you are respecting everyone, thinking of yourself less. The disciples were driven by an inner desire. We already know that. They thought they were better than. They thought they were better than one another. The disciples had a better than complex. And it revealed something but not the character of Christ. Serving with humility always reflects the character of Christ. Always reflects the character of Christ. Where does it begin? Well, it starts with the mind. The humility of the mind. The humility of the mind, what causes you to have awareness, what causes you to think. The Bible says in verse 47, Jesus knowing their thoughts. Now hold on right there. Jesus knowing their thoughts. Sure, God knows all things. And because he is omniscient, yes, he knows all things. But Jesus knew their thoughts. Did you know our thoughts are words to Christ? Our very thoughts are words to Christ. As we stand in front of people and we smile and we think something different, God hears those words that are in our mind. He knows our thoughts. 
It's not good to try to play with God. Not good to try to fool him. He knows our thoughts. Jesus knowing their thoughts. Now, while it is Jesus, let me give you another example of how people could know your thoughts. Let's deal with our parents. Have you ever been up to something? It might not have been very bad, but you were up to something. It went against the rules. Have you ever been up to something? And all of a sudden, your mother, she kind of asks you, what are you up to? And you, you say, uh, how did you know? She knows your thoughts. Yeah, so sometimes our thoughts are written all over our face, but here is Jesus able to read, able to hear, able to understand their thoughts. And let's not go into the whispers. You know, the whispers like, I ain't trying to gossip, and you didn't hear it from me. I'm just sharing this for a prayer request. No, those whispers are loud cries to God. So in his omniscience, he's well aware of what's really going on inside of us, deep down inside of us. And he knows when we are being humble. He knows our humility. He knows how we're approaching the situation because he knows all things. What this tells us, Jesus knowing their thoughts, is we must Guard our thoughts. Never let your thoughts be out of control. Guard your thoughts with a spirit of humility at all times because it's your mind. It's your mind. And once your mind is captivated, then it's going all over the place and you have a hard time trying to capture it back. Keep your mind, guard your thoughts so that Christ can receive the glory that he deserves. That's being a servant, serving with humility. Then there's the humility of attitude. Going back to that verse, verse 47, uh, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child. He knew their thoughts. He took a little child and had him stand beside him. And then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Jesus takes an opportunity to teach. Wow, don't you love those teaching moments of Jesus? I mean, don't you just love them? I don't mean when he would stop and teach by the road. I don't mean when he would give a parable. I mean when he gets you by yourself and he teaches you. Don't you just love those teaching moments, after you have, uh, you know, experienced a particular situation in your life and you thought you did it all right and Jesus comes along and he says, let me teach you about this now. Let me give you a little correction here. Uh, let me guide you a little bit. Those teaching moments are so important. So here are the disciples thinking in their mind that they are right, that they are the greatest. Here are the disciples thinking that pride is the way, thinking prestige is the way, and here is Jesus ready to teach in his gentle way. He brings a child. Why a child? Because of their attitude. It's a humility of attitude. A child is not seeking glory. A child is never seeking fame. A child is very obedient. They're willing to do what needs to be done to keep everyone happy. A child. They're very tender in their spirit and very, very truthful. They're willing to comply with your request, a child, a humble child. I remember not too long ago, here at Crossroads Covenant Church, we were having one of our Thanksgiving giveaways. And at this time, we had people come to the church and pick up their Thanksgiving baskets. As I pulled up this particular night, I heard a little girl saying to her father, but it hurts, it hurts, it hurts so bad. And I heard him say, just put them on. We got to go inside because we got to get this basket. And the little girl, as she would put these shoes on, would cry and say, but they hurt so bad. He said, well, just take them off and come inside. They were not members of our church. They were members of the community. And this little girl, in the rain, walked inside the church. She met another little girl. They were both about four years old. And the little girl who she met, they ran down the hall and they ran back. 
They ran down the hall, and they would run back. They became quick friends. They became immediate partners. They was together. It was such a joy to see them run and play, and it was such a joy to see this young girl who had never been to our church find a friend so quickly in a little child. I noticed something as they ran back and forth. Pretty soon, the girl who was a member of our church, she didn't have on shoes, but the, the other girl, she did have on shoes. And I noticed that they kept running and kept playing and kept running and kept playing. So I asked the little girl after the event was over, what happened to your shoes, little girl? And she looked at me, and this is what she said. Um, I forgot. I forgot. The humility of a child ready to do what God says, ready to share what they have, ready to give to the poor, ready to be a part of the community, took her shoes off and said, I forgot. I don't want to brag about it. I don't need the power. I don't need the prestige. I don't need it to be bragged about. I forgot. Now, she really knew what she had done, but in her own way, as a child, tender and humble, her attitude was, it's not worth it to embarrass my friend and let her know what I've done. Nobody needs to know. It's just between me and God. That's humility. Children were considered insignificant in Jesus' time. They were not privileged. They didn't get to sit at home and do what they wanted to do. Uh, that's another sermon. But children were insignificant. They were treated like insignificant individuals. And Jesus said, this is the least of them. So in the hierarchy of things, you had the male, then you had the female, and then you had the child. They were the lowest on the totem pole, the child. They were the least. And Jesus uses the least to teach two lessons, not one, but two lessons. Here's the first lesson. It's the lesson of welcome. Jesus said this, well, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. He's teaching a lesson in humility about welcoming. You see, the reception of a servant of Christ reveals the attitude of the people towards Christ. I'm going to say that again. The reception, the way that you receive a servant of Christ, the way that you receive them, the way that you welcome them, represents your inner feelings of how you really feel about Christ and God the Father as well. If you don't receive him, it means I don't receive Christ. I don't believe in him. I don't want no part of him. It's the servant of Christ. We have several parables that tell us how Servants of God were treated and how God brought vengeance. It's an attitude. It's a lesson that he's teaching us, an attitude of welcome. Your attitude reflects how you feel about Christ, the way that you welcome his servant. Do you welcome Christ's servant? Do you welcome Christ's servant? Do you welcome uh, uh, the, the message that comes about we're getting ready to get new cars and new houses? Do you welcome that message? You're getting a car. You're getting a car. You're getting a car. Do you welcome that message? Do you welcome? We need to repent. It's time to pray. We need to stop sinning. Do you welcome Christ's servants? In Daniel chapter 4, verse 27, Nebuchadnezzar has called Daniel into his chamber. He has told him a dream, and Daniel has interpreted the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to know what's the meaning, and he says, well, perhaps 
Daniel tells him, Daniel the servant of God, perhaps if you will just stop sinning and do what is right, maybe God will change the situation. I could just imagine, Lord, have mercy, what, what kind of ridicule and what kind of rebuttal a pastor would come up under if he said, hey, brother, hey, sister, let's stop sinning. Sinning? Who are you talking about? Who do you think you is trying to tell me what to do? And that is the importance about how do you welcome? Do you welcome only the good news? How do you receive Christ? The second it's all about attitude. The second lesson is the lesson of the greatest. It's the lesson of the greatest. He's already talked about the lesson of welcome. Now he's going to talk about the lesson of the greatest. Because the disciples were very confused. They didn't understand what greatest was. They, they thought I was great because I had done everything according to the human situation. He says, no, 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 no. You got to be the least. In this lesson of the greatest, he says, if you want to be the greatest, you must be the least. But the disciples didn't get it. So in John chapter 13, Jesus teaches them again. He's already instructed them, but now he has to illustrate it, and he does that in John chapter 13. What he does is it's the Passover. And Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. And he tells them to go prepare the place. And it was the custom to wash the feet of those who were entering the Passover. But nobody washed the feet. The Bible says Jesus took off his outer robe. And he got a basin filled with water. He got a towel and he began to wash the disciples' feet, each and every one of them. Twelve disciples, 24 feet. He began to wash every one of them. He never said, now wash mine. No, no, no. He washed all of their feet. Peter objected, but then after Christ explained it to him, he said, yeah, please, please wash my head, wash my hands, wash all of me then. You see, this lesson of the greatest was all about attitude. Christ took off his robe. That means that this outer garment that represents who I am, my position, I'm willing to take it off in order to serve you. I'm willing to take it off because while I take it off, it does not diminish me. I'll still be Jesus. I'll still have to go to Calvary. I'll still die to save the whole world. I'm still going to be the Christ. I won't lose a bit of who I am by humbly serving you. He got his own water basin. He filled his water basin. Not asking for help, he began to wash the disciples' feet, not asking for anything in return. He was being a true servant. He had taught about it in Luke, but now he's demonstrating it in John. This is how you serve. Wash the feet. Wow. Have you ever washed anybody's feet? Yeah. That's a humble job right there. I used to feel bad for the man who was working in the shoe department in Macy's, but here Jesus took off his robe. He became a servant. And as he served, his disciples taught them and us how to be the servant of the least in order that God will get the glory. It's all about attitude. It's all about attitude. Serving with humility means not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Serve with humility. If you want to be his servant, if you want to be a servant of Christ, serve with humility. Never prideful, but always bold, always speaking in truth. 
always living in truth. If you want to be his servant, serve with humility, never with arrogance, but always with confidence, always with the authority that he's given you. If you're in your home, if you're in the hospital, if you're in your school classroom, wherever you may be, if you're in the basement of your job, wherever you are, serve with humility. Being a servant of Christ is to serve with the attitude of humility, the humility of character, the humility of the mind, and the humility of attitude. Let's be servants of Christ, giving him glory, serving him each and every day with the humility that he deserves. Father, thank you for speaking to us today. Help our hearts to become humble. Let us learn from this lesson that you know our thoughts, that our cries, our whispers, our cries out loud to you. So God, let us guard our mind. Let us guard the thoughts that we think and make them holy, acceptable to you. God, we pray that you will guard our attitude. Let us be like the little girl who gave her own shoes but then kept it secret so that whatever we do, it's between you and us. God, let us serve with humility that you may get glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we gather here today, I want to give you the chance to meet this Jesus, this Christ, the one I'm so proud of, the one that I love to praise his name. You can do it very simply. Join me in prayer. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess I am a sinner. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Allow me to be a part of your kingdom. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe that he rose from the dead. And I believe that your unfailing love is surrounding me right now. Thank you, Father for coming into my heart, for taking over my life, for rearranging my mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Every Wednesday night, you're invited to join us for Bible study. We're studying the book of Ruth. This is chapter 2, so you haven't missed very much. So come on and join us, please. And don't forget, please give to Crossroads. And now in the spirit of the day, I'm going to give us a benediction. It won't be Aaron's blessing, but it will be something that I'm sure you're familiar with. 